Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, today, our speaker is Professor Arnab Kundu from Shaha Institute of Nuclear Physics, Kolkata. Uh, this is the, as far as I can, I always forget, forgot the number. Probably this is the 88th talk in the series. And uh, uh, I'm welcoming you, Arnab, in this QSTM Zuminar series talk. Uh, he's going to uh, speak about information recovery from black holes in doubly hol holographic models. And this work is based on his collaborators and probably students. And uh, yeah, one of you can start. Thank you for uh, uh, your participation in this forum and it is really valuable for us. So you can start. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shantan. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, so uh, great, it's uh, uh, I'm very happy to uh, to give the talk here. Uh, so as uh, Shantan already mentioned, uh, that the title is Information Recovery from Black Holes in W Holographic Models. Uh, so this is a field that uh, currently is uh, you know extremely active, to, to put it uh, mildly. Uh, and a lot of things are happening uh, uh, happening in the field. So what I decided to do is uh, actually spend quite a bit of time in trying to sort of mention, uh, if not explain, uh, the basic ingredients uh, uh, that are needed in this uh, in this uh, in this framework. Uh, in particular, within a within a uh, within a particular class of models, which I refer to as these doubly holographic models. So I'll I'll try to explain all of these words. Uh, as the talk goes along and uh, it, 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 i mean needless to say that if you have any questions comments please please do interrupt uh, it's better that way and uh, what i will try to uh, so after explaining uh, i think the basic premise etc which will take probably the most part of the talk so i'll try to uh, tell you some of the things that some of us uh, are trying to do uh, in particular uh, some works that uh, actually uh, are in progress right now with uh, Elena Caceres uh, and uh, Sanjit Shashi from University of Texas and uh, Ayan Patro, who's my student here. So that uh, that part will probably consist uh, 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 in terms of time. I, I'll spend uh, the least amount of time in, uh, uh, in, in that part, but, but, but by the time I get there, uh, it, it should be clear what we are trying to do. Okay. Great. So, uh, just a second. Ah, uh, good. Good. Let me start with the outline. Uh, so, as I said, what I will do is uh, I'll introduce you uh, to you uh, the basic ingredients uh, by reviewing them. And some of the basic ingredients are, for example, what is known as generalized entropy in in gravitational uh, theories and islands and what, what people mean by islands and so on and so forth. So more, many of these things that I will mention, actually, unfortunately, I'm, I won't have the time to do an explicit calculation. Instead, uh, there are papers that I will loosely refer to uh, if you are really interested and if you some, for some reason cannot find that paper, uh, 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 you can contact me later and I'll be happy to give you the references. So in, in most of this, in, in fact, all of these parts, I'll be talking about work by other people. Uh, in the past couple of years uh, and there are there are too many references also uh, so i will not i'll try not to list all of them uh, so i'll keep it very minimal uh, so yeah so as i said i'll try to introduce uh, this notion of generalized entropy and islands and then uh, i'll try to talk about uh, 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 try to talk about how you can sort of see the uh, the the uh, uh, a hint of information paradox, uh, e even when you have eternal black holes, uh, especially in ADS uh, and space spacetime. So that would be the uh, that would be the uh, basic ingredients. And then uh, I'll move on to this. Uh, uh, I'll move on to discussing basically a particular class of models, which are known as uh, doubly holographic constructions. And there also, I'll try to be sketchy, I mean, with equations, et cetera, but I'll not be giving you all the details because the details, I mean, there are really far too many details, uh, uh, which are often not actually essential also for the story to be told. So that's uh, that's also, uh, that's introducing the model and the strategy, et cetera. And then what happens is, uh, so once you have 
uh, sort of uh, appreciated uh, these two points or these two uh, 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 these two topics then uh, comes the question of uh, you know trying to uh, trying to sort of push various ideas of uh, of these models and of these problems uh, and 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 push them to the to the limits uh, that you that you understand them uh, a little better in, in particular uh, uh, in a lot of things that i have to say i'll be talking about things like fine grained uh, fine grained entropy uh, although I say here fine grained physics, uh, what I really mean is uh, I'll be talking about some notions of entropy and so on. Um, but the, the, the point you can ask is to what extent this fine grained physics is, is going to be accessible uh, if I have a certain kind of constraint in the restriction uh, or in the model itself. So I hope this part, uh, you know, if it's not clear, I mean, and it should not be clear right now it should become clear uh, as as the talk progresses so if if it doesn't become clear uh, please do ask me uh, at the end of the talk okay so with that let me begin so for example the first thing uh, one of the first things uh, one of the first ingredients that you need in this uh, in this particular uh, topic uh, is something called a quantum extremal surface so let me start uh, try to explain what that is so this this diagram here i hope you can see my cursor uh, so this diagram here, the cylindrical diagram here, is basically an ADS space. Uh, this is the global patch of ADS, and in particular, I don't uh, I don't need to specify to any dimension. So I'm taking basically just ADS uh, d plus one dimensional ADS. <clears throat> and uh, as you know, time moves up, moves upwards along the parallel to the white uh, uh, white vertical lines. Now suppose, given that. Uh, uh, given that we know that uh, you know the boundary of the ADS, for example, one particular time slice of which is given by this by this circle, by this white circle here, uh, the boundary uh, is described by essentially a CFT that lives in, and ADS CFT duality tells me that uh, the CFT that is living on the boundary of this ADS is actually dual to the entire gravitational uh, dynamics that is happening in the bulk. So that we know. Now, you can ask a slightly finer uh, question uh, in the following sense. Let's suppose I take this t equal to constant slice uh, that we have drawn here. And now, instead of taking the full slice, I consider only a part of this, uh, this slice, which is denoted by this blue arc. Uh, and I call this, uh, uh, let's give it a name, B. Right? So the B is, uh, technically speaking, is a boundary subregion. I have a boundary, and I choose a subregion, some arbitrary subregion. And uh, and A, uh, as as is clear by the drawing, hopefully, A is basically just a, uh, just a, uh, just an arbitrary uh, co-dimension two surface in ADS. I do not specify what this A object is, other than saying that this is a co-dimension uh, surface hypersurface that lives in ADS. Of course, the two endpoints have to end on the two endpoints of the of the subregion. Okay. So, so that is the that is the premise, and and then you can ask the question that given this B, which is a subregion of the full uh, full uh, CFT of, or the full region on which the CFT is defined, uh, is there a notion in which I can say that this subregion is dual to a part of the geometry? Right. That's a that's a reasonable question to ask, and the answer is uh, indeed you can give a you can give a very precise answer to this question. Uh, by looking at the following thing, so let me just give you the answer first. The answer first is that the answer is that uh, the the bulk region to which this subregion is dual to is basically uh, the region that is uh, you know within this blue line and the red uh, red uh, uh, red hypersurface. So whatever is within this region, within this bulk region, uh, is dual to the uh, dual to the boundary subregion B. <clears throat> and um, so how do we how do we sort of see that? Well, one way to see that is to construct uh, this uh, generalized entropy function, uh, and that I have defined here. So let me let me explain the two terms here. So what you compute? So this quantity on the left hand side is a is a bulk quantity because it is defined given a uh, given a hypersurface A. It's it's a functional of that hypersurface, right? So there are two terms. The first term is the area of A. So that's a fairly simple thing. So given this hypersurface, you just compute the area and divide it by 4G Newton. That's completely, uh, that's pretty straightforward. And then there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a term which I call S bulk. So what is exactly S bulk? 
S bulk is suppose <clears throat> you were able to compute uh, 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 because there is a there's a hypersurface like this. You know there are degrees of freedom which is inside this, and there are degrees of freedom which is out, which are outside this uh, this hypersurface. Now suppose you were able to compute the entanglement between the two. Uh, Two sets of degrees of freedom. In other words, if there was a quantum field uh, living in this ADS bulk geometry, and I, I bipartition that uh, quantum field uh, configuration uh, with this uh, hypersurface A, then I could compute in principle uh, the entanglement entropy between the uh, between the bulk uh, uh, sorry between the region which is inside and uh, and the one which is outside, right? So suppose we compute that. So and on note. Once you uh, talking about the entanglement between bulk and A, uh, so once you write down A's bulk, you uh, like have to consider some kind of reduced density matrix. Like you have to like That's partially right. trace over A and then write down the volume and That's it, I think. Okay. okay. That's right. That's right. So I'm I'm tracing over all the degrees of freedom, for example, which are on the left of this red arc. Right. So then you will be, you will be left with uh, only the uh, only the degrees of freedom which are inside, okay. which are enclosed between the between the boundary subregion curve and the bulk uh, hypersurface. Sure. Right. So so as you know, as you can see that uh, given each of these hypersurfaces, I can do this computation at least in principle, and it will keep generating uh, a functional which is this S gen of A. Right. So if you if you if you give me an A. I go ahead and do first two calculations. One is the area, the other one is this entanglement calculation, and then I, I get this result. Now, what am I supposed to do with that? It's, it's a family of uh, hypersurfaces, right? So A is completely arbitrary, so how do I fix it? Well, what you have to do is once you have got this, suppose you have got this full functional, then you have to extremize this functional in the space of A. And suppose you are able to find that extremal surface, uh, 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 I, I'm of course not giving you an explicit example here, but suppose you can solve that problem um, by just the usual method. There, once you know S as a functional of A, and then you just extremize this functional and uh, compute uh, the the extremal A, and that extremal surface is going to be known as the quantum extremal surface. Although it's a completely classical surface, I mean the hypersurface itself is classical, but the name quantum uh, uh, yeah, comes from basically considering this contribution of the S part. Okay. And if you have more than one extremal surface, for example, uh, then you choose the minimum of that. So that's the that's the prescription. So so I hope it's clear that at least in principle, uh, you can indeed compute this object, and you can indeed find the quantum extremal surface. This was, uh, by the way, uh, 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 essentially proposed a very famous paper by Engelhardt and Wall in 2014. Okay. Any any question about this? Okay, let me let me go to the uh, second part then. So then the statement is the following. Uh, so then uh, you, you know this, this statement about uh, what boundary subregion is dual to what bulk subregion, etc., is uh, uh, goes by the name of entanglement wedge reconstruction, which basically says that the gravity subregion, which is dual to B, is the region between A star and B. So basically, uh, this is the answer that I already gave you. That once you have found the quantum extremal surface, then you can you obviously obtain the the region between A star and and B, and that region is going to be dual to dual to the subregion boundary subregion B, and the entanglement entropy of of the boundary subregion B is going to be obtained by basically just uh, computing the uh, area uh, computing the generalized entropy of the quantum extremal surface and taking the minimum of it if you have more than one uh, such extremal surface. Right. So now let me give you an example without really uh, calculating. Let me just tell you a story. If you want uh, uh, want to know the calculation of details, there's a, uh, there's a very nice paper by uh, uh, I think Almeri, uh, uh, Maldasen, and Mahajan, uh, where you can find the details of the calculation. This is a very very suggestive and very nice calculation. So let's start with simple plain ADS. So let me explain this diagram here. It's a bit of a uh, it's a bit cluttered, unfortunately. But if you look at the blue lines, right? So this blue vertical line and this triangle here, uh, uh, for me, it denotes an ADS2, uh, the Poincare patch of ADS2, to be more precise. 
So what I have in mind is basically some sort of a JT, uh, JQ type, worm type gravity theory, J2 dimensional gravity theory for which the DS2 is a solution. And this is the space time, right? This is the Euclidean, uh, sorry, uh, this is the, uh, this is the uh, 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 Lorentzian space time uh, that I have here. <clears throat> so now, suppose, suppose that's all I had. I just had this uh, point for ABS and I considered a boundary subregion, which is this green dot. Okay. Now you might wonder, given that boundary subregion, what is the region? Uh, uh, I could, I could in principle carry out uh, this exercise that we just alluded to here, and I should be able to find an A star. So if you do that calculation, you will find that the A star actually sits right here on the edge of this, uh, this triangle. So therefore, uh, if, you, if I give you a boundary subregion, which is a dot here, it's going to be dual to the full, uh, you know, full uh, point for a patch of ADS, which is not a surprise because that is what it should be. Right? We know AD, that's a statement of ADS. Now, now let's do the following thing. We are going to do something uh, different to this. So what we are going to do is given this uh, ADS boundary, uh, we are going to glue uh, uh, a half of a Minkowski space such that uh, uh, such that there are uh, 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 there are mode exchanges. In other words, basically the way I glue this uh, this red patch here, uh, which makes the entire geometry asymptotically flat, uh, is that I allow in it exchanges of modes uh, uh, along this uh, along this blue vertical line. In other words, radiation or quanta that could that previously could not escape because it is as a reflecting boundary condition can now escape into the red region so what have i done in terms of the boundary safety perspective is is basically here so i have a green dot here right which was this dot itself so that was just a quantum dot if you wish now i have coupled to that quantum dot a quantum wire which is denoted by this red red line here such that I allow energy exchanges from the green region to the red region. And the red region for me is going to work like a bath. And this is how a bath uh, usually a couple to systems, right? I mean, if you have a system and then you couple it to a bath such that the system can, uh, you know, uh, can send energy uh, uh, or dump energy to the, to the, in, into the bath. So that is basically the, the, uh, the, the framework. Suppose we do that. Now suppose, uh, and if we do that, then something really peculiar happens. What is that? Uh, if I do that and then go back and do the same calculation again, what I would find is instead this A star is no longer sitting on the, at the tip of this triangle, but it moves inwards. And in fact, it sits somewhere in the, in, somewhere uh, inside the bulk region, which is denoted by this yellow dot. So why is that strange? That is strange because now it says that the region which is dual to this green dot coupled to this red wire is actually within this diamond right that's what we just uh, we just said uh, in terms of the entanglement with reconstruction so the entanglement with reconstruction simply say that the green dot is dual to this uh, this diamond region here now that's still okay but now if we ask the following question that because you know I know the full system, the, the green dot and the red wire, this is a pure state, right? I have not coupled it with anything else. Uh, there is no other bath coupling this, uh, this total system to, uh, 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 to an external bath or so on. So this in itself, in totality, this is a pure state. So therefore, whatever region I have without the, without the green dot, in other words, the complementary region without the green dot should be, should be dual to the uh, to whatever space time you are left with, right? Because uh, after all, that has to carry that has to have the the whole information of the system. Now there are two two uh, the causal uh, or slash entanglement which uh, reconstruction that you can do. One is, for example, given this red line here, you can of course draw a causal diamond, uh, which is purely in the Minkowski part. So that's also standard because uh, you know given a line segment. Uh, I can always, in, in, in flat space, I can always draw its uh, causal diamond. And of course, everything depends on if within the, within the causal diamond uh, uh, is encoded on the, on, the, on, the, on the line itself. But that is not the surprising part. The surprising part is that 
I can of course draw another causal diamond here from A star to the end of the uh, point where I pass the ADS, right? Which is basically this causal diamond here. Now, if this pool system is indeed a pure state, then I have to conclude, I have no other choice but to conclude that this red region is dual to, of course, here, by dual, I mean all the information, uh, the, the red region encodes information of this, uh, of this uh, red diamond, as well as the, dime, the entanglement wedge that is well within the bulk, right? So this is the strange part of it, because uh, apparently this red line should know nothing about what is happening, what is going on in the, in the deep in the bulk, right? So this green dot and the yellow dot are far apart. I mean, uh, they're, uh, they're not infinitesimally close either. So they're order, at least order one apart for sure. So uh, in fact, and you can make that distance uh, parametrically large also. Now, uh, so that, that is the surprising part because it says that, uh, I mean, it sort of raises the question that how can uh, uh, such a far region, uh, you know, the information that is contained in such a far region be already contained uh, within, uh, within this, uh, within this, uh, within this path itself. So that's, that, that's the strange part of it. And uh, this, this, uh, such regions now have a name, which are called, uh, uh, called the islands. So by islands, uh, essentially, I mean, uh, regions of this sort. Okay. So, uh, so, so is, is there any, any question uh, about this? Um, hello, Professor. Uh, I have two, two questions to ask. So first of all, uh, you you passed with a Minkowski space time. Uh, like, why did you pass with particularly with Minkowski space time? Because uh, the calculation will be simpler, or uh, the, is there a, any deeper meaning? Okay. Um, well, I mean, it's sort of natural. Like, if you think about uh, uh, yes, in a certain sense, it's it's simple, but it's also natural because uh, uh, I mean, you have to find the find the geometry that is loose to the to the boundary of the ADS, right? And for that, a, a part of Minkowski looks essentially ideal. But if you if you do not land a field theory uh, uh, description, what you're doing is literally this. You have a quantum drop and you're coupling it to a quantum wire, which is something that, I mean, even uh, people do in the lab uh, on a regular basis. Of course, not in this, not systems of this kind, but nevertheless, right? I mean, this, this coupling you can certainly do. So this is a very natural thing to do okay. in that sense. Okay. And, and the second question is, so you said uh, this uh, right diamond is basically dual to the left, uh, a smaller diamond. So by dual, do you mean the entropy of both the regions are same? Uh, so basically you have a pure state and whose entropy is S, and so you divide it to region A and region B and S A equal to S B. Is that is well, that what I mean is, roughly speaking, uh, that uh, the information content on this red line in, in this wire that you have coupled to the dot, right? I mean, right. Uh, it's no surprise that, that this wire contains all the information that is uh, within, the, within the red diamond, right? Because that's what happens in Minkowski space. Given a, given a space like a line segment, you draw the causal diamond and uh, all the information within the causal diamond can be obtained from the data on the red line, right? Because you just move up or down, right? Yes. That's completely standard. But what it also says is that because this entire system is pure state, and we just saw that the that this green dot is only capturing information within this green diamond within the bulk. But this, uh, but but there is this other diamond, right? So this other right. diamond must, uh, 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 yeah, this is this entanglement diamond. So the information that is contained within this entanglement diamond must also be encoded somewhere. But now, given the given the construction, I have no other choice. I have just only these two elements: this green dot and the red wire. The green dot is gone, so all I have is the red wire. So I must conclude that all the information that is contained here, uh, or that is here, that is living here, is already contained on the red line. And that is the surprising part. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Good. So, uh, so let me now say the same thing in a slightly different way. It's actually stating the same thing again. So let's draw that diagram again. Uh, let, let's just let it cleaned up. 
So as we saw that this A star was the uh, was the bulk point, and then you have this island. Now suppose you know you, you take some operator uh, because uh, if I think about some quantum field that's just living in this bulk geometry, I can of course think about some operator, some generic operator that lives within this region, localized generic operator. Then I have to conclude, and I denote that operator by this chi island. Then I have to conclude that there must exist certain operator which I denote by chi tilde boundary that lives on this red line. Now this object may be horribly complicated. We do not know a priori what this is, uh, but I have I, I, I at least uh, this is it is forced 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 upon us uh, to conclude that uh, this this information has to be encoded here. Okay. And as I said, that this, uh, on the other hand, this uh, any operator that lives within this uh, with this red diamond is of course also here because that is the standard uh, uh, causal diamond story that you have in Minkowski. Because I can of course uh, draw my causal diamond starting from this red line here in Minkowski space, and uh, anything any information within that can be obtained from this uh, from data on this. So that's uh, that's standard. Now there is an there is a there is an inherent non-locality of this. Uh, as you can see from the picture itself, because they are disconnected in the picture, yet all the information here are somehow encoded here. Now that's uh, that's not uh, that's very strange, and uh, there are many questions you can ask. Is uh, how how I mean, is there any way I can make this non-locality precise, or is there any way I can make I can even explore uh, not explore I can even uh, you know um, exploit it uh, to my advantage and so on and so forth. And there are many things uh, you can do, and people are uh, people are working on these things. But I will have not much more to say about this. But just wanted to give you a, a, a sort of introduce to you uh, these basic features that uh, that are puzzling and as well as important. Okay. Um, so yeah. So let me just uh, give you some comments. Uh, one remarkable thing is that so far, you know, I have not talked about any black holes anywhere. I have only talked about empty ADS. And uh, as as calculations suggest, that the island regions are are present even for NPAT. So you do not have to have black holes uh, inside, right? Uh, so this is not a feature of black hole. Rather, it's a feature of uh, you can say semi-classical gravity, because that's all we are doing. We are doing semi-classical gravity with uh, with a with a given geometry. Now, uh, as it will become hopefully clear that these islands are going to play a very major role in obtaining what is called the page curve for black holes. In other words, uh, you expect because of unitarity that uh, the, uh, the entanglement entropy of radiation uh, that is coming out from the black hole is going to behave in a particular way. And uh, that particular behavior is going to be reproduced by precisely because of the presence of these islands. Without these islands, you will not have them. And uh, as I already said, that gravity seems to bring out this inherent non-locality that is present, and somehow it becomes important and uh, still gives you uh, and it gives you the right uh, or expected page curve. So this this is just a basic basic quick summary of what I just told you so far. So if you have any question, maybe uh, it's a good point to ask. Okay. So then let me move on. All right, so so I said that the thing, the next bit is eternal black holes and and page curves. So let me just introduce or pictorially what what this thing is about. So given an eternal black hole, which is basically you know uh, if if you take a take an eternal black hole in ADS, uh, then that is given by this square Penrose diagram, right? So that ends on this uh, blue vertical line. But remember, now we are also coupling a Minkowski space. Uh, Onto the uh, we are gluing a Minkowski space onto the ADS boundary, right? Which I have done on, done on both sides. So, so if I take this, uh, uh, so if I take this, then uh, of course, as you know, that this is an eternal black hole. Uh, this it, it exists forever. Uh, but you also know that because it is a black hole, uh, I can compute its entropy, right? And its entropy. Uh, is going to be uh, just the standard Bekenstein Hawking entropy multiplied by a factor of two. And the factor of two comes because I have two black holes, right? One on the left, one on the right. I have two boundaries on the right, on the left. And therefore, I have two, uh, I have correspondingly two black hole horizons also, uh, this one and this one, for example. And uh, uh, and therefore, the, the total entropy is simply two times S black hole. So that's a constant. 
that's that's not changing in time okay but now let's imagine what we have been doing uh, with the setup where uh, you know we had this boundary subregion on both sides these green dots on both sides and then we also couple the the quantum wear on both sides right so what are we counting so we are counting suppose i mean basically we have some detectors uh, uh, which are counting the, the the hawking radiation that's coming out of the black hole and that's all we are just keeping track of uh, how many photons we receive for example now if you look at now remember time goes upwards here uh, in this diagram so if you suppose this is the t equal to zero slice let's look at t equal to zero the t equal to zero we all know that uh, uh, what happens in this geometry roughly speaking very roughly speaking is that there are uh, pair productions because of uh, uh, from which the hawking radiation comes essentially and the the pairs are for example this one and this one these are the epa pairs uh, one is inside the black hole one is outside the black hole but for example, uh, none of these two arrows, which is light greenish arrows, will be detected by either of the detector that is on the right boundary, set on the right boundary, or the left boundary, because it's just simply not intersecting any of them at t equal to zero. However, if you look at this, the, the pink ones, the ones that are falling inside, they're going towards the black hole horizon, both of them are detected, right? So this this EP up here is going to be detected by the uh, by the detectors on both right as well as the left boundary. Okay, good. So we start with some entanglement. Let's say now uh, in, in this case, in, in, in particularly uh, no entanglement really because uh, you can see both these modes, right? Now uh, now let's time evolve. And what has happened to the detector is that this constant slice now looks like this goes up on the right and on the left and now let's see what happens on the left one on the left detector you still observe this pink light or this pink photon for example if you will on the right uh, uh, detector however you no longer see this because this has gone past it and it has missed the detector so now uh, previously you were counting a pure state let's say which consisted of two of these pink photons and now the detector only uh, only counts one of them so now it has increased the entropy right because you have lost one of them you've lost uh, uh, you've integrated out one of them so therefore your ent entanglement has increased similarly previously the, the green uh, photons were not received by any of the detectors but now on the right the green photon is received on the left however it is not received so you don't see two uh, uh, this detector at, at, at larger and larger time you, you would expect this is of course a caricature but uh, it happens to be true you can do a more precise calculation that the that the entanglement entropy will always keep increasing without a bound. Now remember, we already started by saying that the, the this uh, the, this eternal black hole in ADS has a finite entropy. In fact, it's upper bounded by two times the Bekenstein of the entropy. But we seem to have a puzzle. We seem to have a puzzle of the following sort: that if we just compute the total entanglement entropy by this naive counting. We seem to be getting a curve. Uh, let's ignore this uh, subscript, etc. We seem to be getting a curve, which is denoted by this uh, uh, by this orangeish line, uh, which will always keep increasing forever. But that should not happen. We know physically it should really come and hit uh, this or intersect this line of two sph, and it stop. It should stop there. In other words, the the real physical curve should go uh, should increase to this point, and then it should plateau. Then it should be completely flat because they cannot be more than this now this is what you expect from unitarity but this is not what we see from from the from the naive entanglement entropy calculation so now the point is that what is it that you have to do to actually reproduce this calculation uh, with the semi-classical analysis that is the question that that one can ask and uh, it's, it's a good thing to 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 sort of remember this uh, this terminology that uh, precisely when this uh, you know increasing uh, entanglement entropy curve hits the or intersects the constant entanglement entropy curve 
at that point is called the page time because uh, at this point something qualitatively different is happening and uh, uh, and this is what uh, as i said this is what you would expect out of unitarity so this is a version of the information paradox even in the eternal black hole uh, geometry that you can that you can uh, sort of make precise uh, and the paradox is basically as i said that this curve which you naively get is the curve you never see this you never go here you simply keep increasing here and that cannot happen so something is uh, is uh, uh, is subtle here and that uh, uh, that is what uh, I'm going to talk about uh, now. So, so if 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 you have any question about this, maybe it's a good point to ask. Good. Okay. So let me move on. So you, you, you sort of uh, you know you can you can you can sort of try to guess what what has to happen for for you to be able to reproduce the unitary curve, right? And the guess uh, can already give you the correct answer. So let me just give you the, the correct pic picture of this. So, so the, 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 the bottom line is going to be the following, that the surface that we talked about uh, is perfectly fine as long as uh, you are not considering very large times. So suppose the detector, et cetera, that we just talked about, and we designed, in fact, we designed the detector to be, uh, you know, uh, coupled to the to the uh, uh, to be residing in the Minkowski part solely, right? And uh, and we just concluded that that's the detector. That's the only detector that detects. Uh, indeed, if you if you do that, then your entropy curve keeps always increasing, and it never can saturate. However, for some reason, suppose at late times the detector actually does this. So there is some information of the detector here as well, of, or, uh, along a curve like this. If that exists, then you know from our, uh, from our previous diagram that all the modes, all the green modes, remember that, that were exiting from here and here, the green modes that were going from here was being missed by this, uh, by this detector, but now it will, it will intersect this detector. So it will not be missed anymore. And, uh, and the pink one, for example, which was being missed because it went uh, right into the horizon, now will intersect this one. So both the pink and the green ones are going to be detected by this complicated, uh, complicated hypersurface, if I have this indeed. And if I'm looking at a sufficiently late, late time, then this hypersurface will always be constant because all the Hawking pairs, all, actually, all, the, all, the, all, the, uh, all the pair products, uh, all the particles that are being produced by pair production are going to be counted by by this uh, by this non-trivial hypersurface, and that is uh, by definition is going to just saturate to twice Lichtenstein Hawking entropy. So if I can have a situation where my initial uh, uh, initial detectors were just the ones that I showed you uh, earlier, but the later ones are actually comprised of this, then my problem is solved. And indeed, this is the answer to, to the question. But, the, but, the, but now, the, now the question raises is what problem, what, what uh, action principle or what questions am I really solving to obtain this? Right? This is all pictures. So what is the equation that I have to solve, which is what I, I, I am headed right now. OK. So let me comment, uh, I'll just offer a few comments here, and I'll pause for questions if there are any. So for example, as I said, that the islands, so uh, I should have mentioned here, so this, you know, this, this surface is the new one that I had to postulate here, right? And the end of this are uh, are the islands because uh, this has the similarity to the to the to the, to the first first calculation I was just alluding to, where you know islands, some uh, specific point uh, was appearing inside an ADS two inside the bulk of an ADS two as a star. Uh, so these are basically those a star points, right? In the presence of black hole, of course. So the islands are. Uh, uh, are present at a fixed location. This is very important that the, they don't they don't evolve in time. If they evolve in time, then the entropy counting again could evolve in time. So that is not allowed. So that should not happen. And pictorially, as I said, it's sort of clear why why this is happening, why uh, uh, why this is counting all the entropy, and it's also clear why islands are uh, are are, are non-local uh, description of of uh, uh, at at least at this level they certainly are. And in this picture, it was important that the islands were uh, islands were located outside the horizon. Okay, so this is roughly speaking the picture. So if you have any question about the picture, 
this is probably a good point to ask because now I'm going to uh, uh, get into a model which is much which makes these things much more precise. Okay, okay. So let me move on. So how do I sort of derive or even uh, come to this island formula? So let me uh, let me sort of so so it comes from a, uh, uh, you know uh, sort of generic uh, description of uh, what we discussed uh, at the beginning in terms of the quantum dot and the quantum wire, but in general dimension. So what you have is a boundary CFT uh, perspective where you have a d-dimensional CFT which I'll take as a bath. So remember, this was previously a, a quantum wire, which was a one dimensional, uh, uh, excuse me, one plus one dimensional CFT. And it was coupled to a particular quantum dot, which is a zero dimensional CFT. In other words, uh, uh, a CFT which, uh, for which only time direction exists. And that uh, there we took a thermal state. So that was the picture previously, right? And this, uh, so now we are going to generalize it for arbitrary D dimension. And these two systems are at thermal equilibrium because that's what a path does, a path ensures that a state remains at a particular thermal equilibrium. And sort of it is obvious, if I give you just this, that if, or if you have to design such a configuration, it's kind of obvious what you have to do in the gravity perspective. So you have to, uh, there are two duals, right? I mean, uh, naively speaking, the CFT D dimensional CFT would be dual to a D plus one dimensional ADS, and the D minus one dimensional CFT will be dual to a D dimensional ADS. So what's going to happen in this picture is that this ADS D plus one will become, will come from a solution of some supergravity action or some classical gravity, for example. And, and then this CFTD, uh, which is dual to a D-dimensional ADS, will become the theory of, a, uh, of the world volume of a D-brain, like defect, for example, or, or a hypersurface, if you, I mean, it doesn't have to be a D-brain, actually, it, just, it can be a hypersurface itself, okay. So let me describe how that happens. So the action, uh, so hence the name double holography, because you see that uh, uh, I should have already mentioned already mentioned that uh, that uh, you know the, the 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 boundary CFT perspective is really uh, uh, that you have a CFT D which can be dual to an ADS D plus one, but it the, that acts as a path to a system which is D minus one dimensional CFT, and therefore that can be dual to a dual to an ADS D. Here, of course, I'm taking uh, um, uh, both the CFTs at large central charge, but this generic, the, the construction is of course generic. You can do it for small central charge CFT as well, uh, except that you will lose the, the gravitational picture and therefore all the power that comes with it. But this, uh, but the, but the, but the coupling of the uh, of the lower dimensional CFT to a higher dimensional CFT bath is is completely generic. Okay. So now, um, so let's look at the full action. Uh, so suppose I start with this action, that I have a bulk uh, action and a brain action. And the bulk action, as you can see, is a D plus one dimensional gravitational action with a cos negative cosmological constant. So therefore, we know that this can give me a D plus one dimensional ADS as a solution. But the brain action is something like the following. Suppose, uh, for the time being, let's ignore this term. Suppose I look at the first term. The first term is just uh, some standard tension term, uh, some standard volume uh, volume term uh, with a coefficient of, of a brain tension, right? So this is capital T denotes a brain tension. So this is just some uh, uh, some standard brain action that you would anyways write down, where G tilde is the induced metric, and this G is the is the metric of the geometry. For example, in this case, uh, a D plus one dimensional ADS. Now, sometimes you can also write down the intrinsic gravitational dynamics on the brain itself. For example, you could, you could write down a gravitational action comprising uh, or, or emerging out of this uh, induced metric data. Uh, for example, one obvious term that you can write down is just uh, standard Einstein-Hilbert type uh, action with the, with the induced metric and with a coefficient which I denote by one over G brain. So for example, this is exactly an analogy with what you have in gravity where this is one over G Newton, uh, I, I write one over G brain just to uh, sort of keep this uh, two coupling uh, uh, separate. There's no reason this has to be the same. And this description has been uh, sort of clarified in, in recent papers by Myers and collaborators and also by Andres Karch and, and collaborators and, and many other papers as well. Okay. So what you do is the following. So you have to solve basically uh, the equations of motion that come from 
extremizing this total action, both the bulk as, as well as the brain. And one simple solution is given by the following. So you start with the ADSD plus one uh, metric. Uh, I, this is uh, uh, the fact that this is a solution you can check a posteriori, but uh, nevertheless, it's true. So let me describe what it is. So you start with a D plus one dimensional empty ADS and, and somehow you place a D dimensional ADS slices, uh, hypersurfaces in that geometry such that uh, the brain configuration, so this is the brain configuration. The brain configuration is just, uh, uh, it's just going to solve some uh, boundary, uh, uh, boundary condition as far as the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, let me back up for a second. So ADS D plus one already solves the bulk equations of motion, right? Now, if you have a brain on top of that, uh, that will just give you additional boundary conditions that you have to solve. And those boundary conditions or junction conditions are the standard Israel junction conditions. Uh, made out of basically uh, the, uh, the the induced metric data. So, for example, uh, uh, this Kij is the extrinsic curvature made out of the uh, 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 of the of the of the induced metric. Gij tilde is the induced metric itself, and so on and so forth. And 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 this uh, uh, and on the right hand side you have the brain brain stress tensor. This stress tensor is in this case is just proportional to uh, where you do not have additional uh, uh, um, brain gravity, this uh, Tij is just proportional to the induced metric itself up to the up to the tension of the brain. Right. So this is the equation that you have to solve, and indeed you can solve this equation. That's not difficult. I mean, uh, well, it, it can be solved. Let me just put it this way. So instead of writing down the formula, which is not very illuminating, uh, let me draw a diagram. So what happens is the following. So 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 in picture you have. So let's imagine that this uh, yellow region or, 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 the, or the bulk region that is covered by the yellow circle is my D plus one dimensional ADS. So what is the configuration? The configuration is that I have this D plus one dimensional ADS and then somewhere in the middle, I have this D dimensional ADS brain, which satisfies uh, an equation of the kind that I just showed uh, where you know this uh, the, the the change in the extrinsic curvature is basically just the extrinsic curvature on the left hand uh, uh, the difference between extrinsic curvature on this side and that side so if i have two two ADSs on two sides let's say for example with uh, two different uh, radius of curvature this delta kij will uh, will uh, will be non vanishing okay uh, uh, and in general, of course, also it depends on how this brain is embedded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of geometric data encoded in this simple picture, but the picture has been deliberately drawn simple. It's it's not that simple, but uh, it gets the point essentially. So this is really the the, the premise uh, where I, you have basically an ADS d-dimensional ADS brain living inside a d plus one dimensional bulk geometry. Okay, and the point is that this is a configuration that you can obtain uh, by exactly solving this S total, which had a bulk uh, gravitational uh, action uh, coupled to a brain uh, gravitational action. Okay. Is there, is there any question uh, about this? Okay. So let me, let me proceed. So now, uh, in allow with this, we are going to ask the simple questions of uh, of how how to uh, you know sort of uh, compute entanglement entropy of various subregions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, suppose uh, suppose I look at the D plus one dimensional ADS geometry, and then I ask for uh, 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 what is the entanglement entropy of a subregion, which is which is this orange arcs here, which I denote by R capital R. Okay, so that's a that's a valid question. It's a well-defined question, and you know, and we know that uh, the art prescription, or more precisely, the HRT prescription, basically tells us that given these uh, boundary subregions, I have to compute uh, the uh, the, uh, the space-like uh, uh, extremal uh, uh, surface area, to which will give me the which will give me the entanglement uh, 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 entropy. Uh, sorry, I just just to check you. You can still hear me, right? Because I keep getting messages that somehow my internet connection uh, might. Be yes, unstable. yes, I can hear. Okay, okay, good, good. Thanks. Um, good. So, so let's now look at two two particular cases. One is where these boundary subregions are relatively small, 
so then by i mean this is a simple picture but it's also uh, something you can uh, exactly calculate um uh, you will get the rt surfaces will be of this form where they will not really know about the existence of the brain right if these are small enough then they will be confined within the left and the right region however if you keep increasing this suppose you keep increasing the boundaries of region r then at, at some point the extreme area surfaces or the minimal area surfaces are going to be the ones that connect from this, like this way and that way uh, suppose the brain was not present so then it, it would choose this this surfaces right instead of the instead of this uh, uh, of the ones uh, that that were looking like uh, on the left diagram but now because the brain is present these rt surfaces are going to intersect the brain and this intersection causes some some sort of non triviality so there are non trivial contributions coming from the endpoints or the intersection points so the intersection points are what i denote by small sigma r and uh, the rt surfaces i denote by capital sigma r and capital r is the uh, r uh, subregions of the boundaries here. Okay. So now let's look at this case a bit more carefully. So this will have two terms. Suppose I now wanted to compute uh, the entanglement entropy of R and I do all my extremization and blah, blah, which is written here. I find there are two contributions. One is the area of the sigma r surfaces divided by 4 g newton and that comes simply by looking at this picture because you see that these are the sigma r surfaces so you compute the rt uh, area the area of the surfaces the rt surfaces and then you divide it by 4 g, g newton that is the standard rt prescription anyways so that is the first term but remember now these there are non-trivial intersection points uh, 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 which are denoted by which are uh, here described by these yellow dots which are living on the brain, but the brain itself has a dynamical gravity. So when you compute, for example, entanglement entropy of, uh, of this R region, uh, so they, they, there is obviously going to be one contribution coming from the standard RT prescription, but there will also be an area contribution coming from the small sigma R, right? So the area of the small sigma R, if you wish. And that small sigma r is nothing but the intersection of capital sigma r with the brain. And now this object, this object is going to be weighted by one over a factor of g brain, because uh, uh, exactly like uh, like you do in the standard RT formula, instead of one over g newton, you will write one over g brain. So the generalized entropy in in this in this simple picture, in this completely classical picture, is going to look like this. Right, it will have two contributions. In in simple geometric terms, it will have first of all an area contribution, and then secondly, an area of an intersection region, because simply the RT surface intersects the brain. And uh, this contribution, by the way, you can compute. You can you can argue that this is going to be uh, if the, if an RT surface actually intersects the brain, uh, uh, you can indeed compute its contribution uh, to the entanglement entropy exactly like uh, let's say Lipovitz Mandelson method, and it will give you this formula. That's also reasonable, right? Because uh, intuitively it's clear that uh, because the brain has gravity, uh, dynamical gravity on it. Uh, uh, if I want to compute entanglement entropy on the brain, I have to use the same formula as I do uh, uh, as I use the RT formula itself. So this makes sense from from a purely geometric perspective, uh, purely doubly holographic geometric perspective, right? Is this clear, or are there questions about this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So, so. However, there is a subtlety, or there's a there's a there's a uh, different way of uh, uh, saying the same thing essentially, and forget about the doubly holographic perspective. And the only perspective you take is that you are an observer who lives only on the brain, and you know that the brain uh, where, where gravity lives, and you know that the brain is coupled to uh, some sort of a bath, which is this CFT, which is this yellow line. Okay. And all you are doing is you are you are collecting uh, uh, you are you are computing entanglement entropy on this path. Okay, suppose that's the perspective you want to take, which is a valid one. 
Now, from that perspective, what happens is if you want to compute, uh, see, if you want to compute the entanglement uh, of, of, of uh, or, or let me let me let me go through. Let me uh, uh, take two uh, uh, two objects uh, separately. So, first of all, let's look at these curves, these uh, pink curves. So, what are they from the perspective of the brain? So from the perspective of the brain, they are computing an entanglement entropy of a region, which has to have this R, of course, but it cannot be just R because the, the RT surface starts here and ends here on the brain. It should have been, if it were just R, it should have started and ended on the brain, it's on, on, on R itself, but that doesn't happen. It starts on R, but ends on the brain. So these surfaces, in fact, are computing entanglement entropy of a region, which is this R, union with this green line, green vertical line. So if I declare that, then indeed, these surfaces are computing entanglement of, uh, of R union, uh, union, the, uh, union the, the green line, which I now call I loop, okay? And there, is, there are additional terms, uh, which are basically these yellow dots where these uh, RT surfaces, the otherwise bulk RT surfaces are intersecting the brains. And those green, uh, those, sorry, those yellow dots are going to just simply give me the area of the uh, area of the island. Sorry, this del, by this del, I mean the, uh, the area, by the way. And this del is the, uh, is the end point, is the boundary. So if this green line is the island, then this uh, yellow dots are definitely the boundary of the islands. And what we have to compute to compute the entropy is the area of this uh, of this uh, uh, of these yellow dots, right? So from the brain perspective, you have two terms as well as we had just before. Uh, uh, now we are reinterpreting those two terms from the brain perspective, and I must conclude the following thing: that from the brain's perspective, the two terms are first of all this term, which is where uh, the RT surfaces were uh, uh, you know existing in the d plus one dimension. And that was computing entanglement of our union islands. And there's a second term, which is basically just the uh, area of the boundary of the island, but divided by four, one of uh, divided by four, a G brain, because now the gravity is on, on the brain and we are purely an observer living on the brain. So, so, so if you look at this expression, if you look at this expression, what it tells you is exactly what the generalized entanglement entropy uh, uh, prescription is uh, uh, is uh, 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 from a purely uh, uh, brain gravity perspective. So, so another way of saying it is uh, in the doubly holographic model, uh, when you start with, when you have the full classical geometry, you have to assume nothing more than the R2 formula. But once you, you decide to choose to live on the brain itself, then the RT formula, uh, the two terms that come from the RT formula give you two terms, which you can interpret as the as exactly the analogous or not analogous even exactly the two terms that you get from the generalized and generalized entropy formula itself. And the non-locality is also clear because uh, uh, why is this non-local? Well, because you see this is intersecting at two points. Uh, uh, and and uh, essentially they are connected in a higher dimension. So if I'm on the brain, if I'm, if I'm an observer on the brain, I would never know that these two points are actually connected, right? Uh, but they are in this picture uh, 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 naturally connected by, 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 this, by this configuration, okay? So, 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 yeah. B before I before I move on, this is uh, you, if you have any doubts, this is probably a good place to stop. Okay. So let me now go to a very simple case and go back to the two-dimensional gravitational uh, system again. As we said, that, that there is a boundary perspective. We start with a one-dimensional CFT quantum dot, which we couple to a uh, 2D CFT uh, bar, which is a quantum wire. And it has a perfectly valid bulk description where you have an ADS3 description, which is dual to this bar. And in that bar, there's an ADS2, which is dual to this CFT bar. So that's a completely geometric prescription. And you can do your RT calculation just here, just in here, and you will get, uh, uh, you'll get islands and so on and so forth. That's, that's the statement. 
But there is also the intermediate brain perspective where you forget that this is actually, you are living actually in ADS3. You simply say that there's a, there's a brain gravity. This ADS2 is on the brain and the brain itself has a dynamical gravity, but that is coupled to a CFT2, which is above here. So that's a somewhat of a, a mixture of these two, these two perspectives. But in this perspective, you, you start seeing the islands and these non-localities. You don't see the non-localities here. Okay. Good. So let me describe you, uh, to you a very simple calculation that you can do with this. So for example, if you take the eternal BTZ geometry, uh, of course, it is in three, three dimensions. The BTZ has, uh, has angular direction, direction, which I denote by phi. And in this picture, Z is the radial direction. So what you do is, uh, is exactly this. So this, uh, so this blue vertical line is now my brain. And uh, this green region is the radiation region. In other words, this is the bar where I am collecting my Hawking quanta, for example, or where I'm computing my entanglement entropy. Now, if this is what I want to do, uh, and my interval is basically running from phi r to all the way to infinity, then there are standard two, uh, two RT surfaces I can immediately draw. One, which starts from phi r and ends at some point on the brain itself. So it intersects the brain. So remember, so this is one of them that I that we just saw in the previous picture. But there's another RT surface, which is which is staying at constant phi r, but it falls all the way to the horizon. And in fact, in the in the eternal black hole uh, picture, it actually uh, goes all through uh, through the horizon and emerges on the other side of the of the boundary. So, so z equal to z h is the is the horizon. So so this RT surface, for example, goes through the horizon. This one does not know about the horizon. And as you can see, if you think about a dynamical process as time varies, this is never going to change, right? because uh, you just fix your phi r and this gets fixed. There is no time evolution or anything like that. However, this one, uh, the, the one that goes to the horizon, if you remember the, 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 uh, the eternal black hole picture, uh, uh, the, 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 the horizontal lines that were going through the horizon, uh, in fact, in particular, the bifurcation point, if you time evolve, they, those surfaces also evolve and those surfaces actually change. So these are known as the hartman malthus inner surface. Okay. So the basic story is the following, that you have two candidate surfaces uh, for, the, for an entanglement entropy calculation, and you have to pick the minimum of them. And uh, so there are some formula here. For example, I have written down the metric here uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the black hole uh, factor, where z equal to zh, uh, this h vanishes, and therefore this uh, horizon, as you can see. And the the hartman malthus inner surface has a has a has an area which is uh, which is uh, which is written here. This is, by the way, the exterior of the area. So this area is the exterior area. Uh, in the interior, the area can change depending on what time slice you are living living off. Okay. So you can do this calculation. The moral of the story is you can indeed do this calculation, and the calculation is basically a competition, determining a competition between the hartman malthus inner surface. And the exterior, uh, uh, and the exterior, uh, uh, exterior R RT surface. The exterior RT surface, remember, intersects the brain, and therefore it gives you the, the islet. So, so you have basically these two expressions. Eventually, uh, these area functional and these area functional, and you have to compute them and compare. Now, if you do that, what you find is the, that it's easiest to com compute and compare at t equal to zero, where the hartman malthus inner surface is uh, basically just uh, have no piece in the interior, and you just can compute the exterior uh, part of it, which is easy to compute, and uh, and you can you can compare it with the uh, with the with the other uh, RT surface area, for example, and what happens is that uh, something like this. So, so as phi r increases, so this delta a is a difference between the exterior RT surface and the hartman malthus inner surface. And remember, we are supposed to choose the minimum of the two. So, so as you see that if phi r is small, then, uh, then hartman malthus inner surface is uh, bigger than the exterior one, right? But if, if, you, if you go to a, a sufficiently large phi r, 
then the initial hartman maldacena surface will definitely be smaller than the exterior uh, surface right so t equal to 0 i will have to choose for sufficiently large pi r i will have to choose the hartman maldacena surface as the right entanglement entropy calculation right but we know that that the hartman maldacena surface will evolve in time will grow in time but the ae will never go grow in time so eventually it will come uh, there come a point there will come a point where the hartman maldacena surface will actually exceed the uh, will actually exceed the uh, exterior uh, rt surface area and therefore uh, now the now the exterior RT surface area will become the minimum of that, and so we have to that. I, I have a question. So morally, yes, uh, sure. So when it is goes positive, it is almost looks like a straight line, but it is in the negative side. It is like some curvature is in the this uh, delta. Why this is so? Yeah, I think it's just a property of the functions. Um, uh, uh, so you are looking for some analytic intuition why this uh, is proportional to pi r for example as, at large pi r um, that I have to think about there might be a way to way to see that but um, off the top of my head I can't really uh, say what is the reason I mean this is some just some some function right that uh, that you are computing and these functions are computed numerically so, but but it is true that in a particular region you may be able to have an analytic hand. I, I have not thought about it actually. Okay. But uh, but yeah. But probably you can get the linear piece. Uh, you can get it. Uh, uh, yeah. Linear behavior may come out in a particular in an appropriate approximation. Okay. Good. So uh, so the point is that the uh, once the page uh, sorry. Uh, so the point is that uh, what you do seem to get, uh, sorry, I should have had a picture here, probably I don't, okay. So the point is the following, let me just say what we, what we, what we learned. Um, uh, the point is that uh, we start with, um, uh, if, we, if we follow this prescription, we start with the, uh, with the hartman maldacena surface, which grows in time. And then uh, there comes a point where the ex where the exterior RT surface becomes the minimal one, and therefore you have to stick to that. And the exterior RT surface does not grow in time. In fact, it's a constant. So exactly what we get is a is a is an increasing curve which goes into a constant curve. That's what we expected uh, from an unitary uh, uh, unitary evolution, anyways. In 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 this context, in this eternal black hole context. And there, uh, I mean, in, you, you can in fact also determine the page time and so on and so forth. So this this uh, this uh, uh, this reconciles with that, and that's that's a very nice thing. It's a consequence, and in fact, this is a calculation that is uh, that you can do in a uh, relatively in a, in a straightforward way within the W holographic models. Okay. So there, these are the comments which are uh, just. Uh, a, for example, the first one you can indeed obtain a page curve for the for the eternal black hole, and um, and as I said, that the coupling uh, to the thermal path is actually very crucial. If you don't do that, you, you don't actually get this. So this is a very important part. So, so the path uh, plays a rather important part, which brings us to a more important, uh, rather more interesting question. For example, to what extent I can quantify the dependence of this page curve on what is happening to the path? So for example. There are many things you can do, uh, but uh, uh, perhaps in view of time, let me just uh, go straight to the uh, question that, that I can, uh, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is the work uh, uh, right now in progress and hopefully appear very soon. Um, and that question is the following, that suppose you change the bath to not just a CFT, but a generic quantum field theory, which is still large, then, but it's not a CFT. So what I mean by that is that the uh, uh, that the QFT, the quantum field theory, has a scale, at least one scale uh, uh, in itself, and therefore the page time should depend in a particular way uh, to that scale. Said differently, uh, you know what we are extracting with this uh, entanglement entropy curve and so on and so forth is actually a fine-grained quantity in the sense that uh, the the, uh, the the fact that you are able to reproduce the correct page curve itself tells you that you have some some uh, access to uh, to a finer grained information than you do uh, with the thermal entropy so for example if you track thermal entropy it would never tell you about page curve right 
thermal entropy does not change but entanglement entropy does so that's a more finer uh, fine grained quantity now the question you can ask is uh, suppose i take the path to be a generic quantum field theory which has its uh, mass scales and so on and so forth and in fact it can go through an rt of its own which would be coarse graining itself so the if the bath is coarse graining itself then um, do i still have the uh, uh, access to the to the fine grained information or not and if so in what way so this might be interesting not just in the context of just black holes but you can think of it uh, you know generically uh, whenever you are interested in, in in a question of this sort uh, where you have a system uh, which is undergoing a unitary evolution and that system is coupled to a bath you can always ask if the bath itself is going through uh, some coarse graining how how does the page time or how does the signature of unitarity respond to that course really? or in what way when do i lose the uh, uh, lose the capacity to or ability to capture the fine grained information if i post in my bath uh, uh, you know arbitrarily so that sort of question so let me get to that so the the framework there is going to be something similar except that the bath i will take the path I will take is now going to be just a simple relevant deformation of a d-dimensional CFT. So instead of a CFT, I'll take a CFT, but add a relevant deformation. But remember, now we are not talking about arbitrary states. We are, in fact, talking about very specific thermal states uh, of the bath. The bath itself is a, is, a, is a thermal bath. So therefore, the thermal state is going to be some black hole in the plus one dimensional ADS. And the way to uh, introduce a relevant deformation to, to, to such a scenario is very standard. So for example, if you take an action of this kind uh, that is written here, here I have, of course, suppressed uh, the G Newton uh, factors of G Newton. Also, I have suppressed, I think, uh, I have set to one uh, the ADS curvature scale, etc. But this basically says that, of course, if I did not have the scalar part, as you can see, I would have a, a ADS, ADS uh, geometry, in fact, ADS Schwarzschild geometry for that matter. But if you have the scalar, then the ADS, uh, uh, you could still have an asymptotically ADS geometry, but the scalar might back react and change the interior of the geometry. So you, you could still have a black hole, but it will not be a, a simple ADS Schwarzschild black hole in terms of geometry. So that's the geometry, but in terms of the dual, uh, you know, CFT plus relevant deformation, what it says is that uh, uh, it will change the thermal state of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the bath basically okay so uh let me first describe what happens roughly speaking uh i i sorry i forgot to put references i should have mentioned the the reference explicitly here but there there are a few papers by uh, sean hartnell and uh, and friends uh recently in the last year where they were studying in this 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 kind of flows in, in four dimensional geometry uh for from a different perspective i think from a slightly different perspective but nevertheless let's uh, we will uh, what i what i will say here is basically using exactly uh, what they were doing uh, so i should have cited them actually here but anyway um good so so so, so what what you have to do you have to find now uh, geometrically you have to find the, the solution you find the geometry itself previously it was just simple ADS, but now i have to find the geometry and the way we do it uh, uh, the details are not that important, but the way we do it is simply you set some near boundary data. So you assume or you impose that at the boundary, this becomes an ADS D plus one, D plus one dimensional ADS space time. And you insert or impose certain boundary conditions on the scalar, uh, which is going to uh, now grow as you go towards the, towards the interior or towards the bulk part of the geometry. And it changes the geometry because it back reacts and so on. So those boundary data are given in these expansions. So if you wish, this is a, these are expansions in small r. r going to zero is the boundary. And uh, so, so phi has an expansion. The sky field has also an expansion. And r squared gtt, which is basically uh, or no, an information what is delta? delta is the conformal dimension or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Delta is the conformal dimension of the operator that you would introduce. In fact, uh, because you want relevant deformation, you want delta to be less than d. Yes. But in terms of parameters, uh, delta is just basically given by the, the, the set by the mass square of the scalar. Sure, sure. By this, by this formula, for example. 
Okay. So you set these boundary conditions and you ask your equations to solve. So that's that's one set of boundary condition. And of course, uh, in absence of the scalar, if you set the scalar to zero, you see that the first line goes away. The first line, everything is zero, but the second line remains. But the second line still is uh, non-zero. I mean, the right-hand side still remains, and that's just a, just a simple ADH for strange geometry. Good, so we start with that, and now we introduce this deformation. So something is, has, to, has to happen. And in fact, what you can do is you can actually determine uh, the, so to speak, near singularity data. So we know that the Schwarzschild geometry has a singularity. In this coordinate, that singularity uh, is located at r going to infinity. But if I now, with the scalar back reaction, analyze this r going to infinity limit, what you will find is that this, these various functions that are present in the metric take the following form. So for example, phi of r goes as log of r with some coefficient. So does uh, chi of r, but the coefficient is not independent, not independent. And this f of r uh, now picks a minus sign, remember, because uh, now you are inside the black hole. So your uh, your time direction has switched sign. And uh, it goes as r is to some power, where that power is set by the dimension uh, in which you're working in, as well as this constant c, which is not fixed. That's a free parameter here. Okay. Uh, up to this analysis. So this is an asymptotic sol solution as R goes to infinity. So to put it more uh, directly, uh, you can do a coordinate change. For example, R is equal to tau to the minus two rho. If you do that substitution, this metric particularly will take a very, uh, a very standard form of a Kasner universe. So, so, so now uh, remember that uh, R has become time-like, so therefore the tau square, which is actually a radial coordinate, has a minus sign, and dt, which was uh, outside the black hole time-like, has now become space-like, so it has uh, it has a plus sign, and so on and so forth. And all these exponents, dt, px, etc., p phi, they are actually determined in terms of uh, the dimension in which you are working in, as well as this constant c. This constant C is not something we can fix from this asymptotic analysis, but uh, but this is fixed. This is not free in terms of uh, the boundary data. So once you fix the boundary data, in particular the, the values of phi naught, etc. By phi naught, I mean you know if I refer to the boundary expansion here, you see that there is only one parameter, uh, this phi naught. If I set this phi naught, this chi is fixed in terms of phi naught. This O is just an expectation value that you can also read off. But I, I would generally not fix this, I would fix this one. And if I do that, then this constant C also gets fixed uh, by the equations of motion. But for that, you have to actually solve the full equations of motion, which unfortunately you can't do uh, analytically, or at least uh, doesn't seem to have an analytic solution, but you can do it numerically. The point is that what this deformation does is that it changes the classical interior geometry of the black hole drastically or at least substantially. So, uh, so, 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 of course, outside the horizon, uh, qualitatively, it's not much of a change. In fact, you can make it a bit more quantitative as well. But inside the horizon, it certainly is a, is a, is a very, very different geometry altogether. Okay. So now, the point is that we take this geometry, and now we add this uh, uh, additional brain, and on that brain, we're going to do this all this entanglement calculation. And that, let me not, you know, this, these details, etc., are not that important. But pictorially, the following thing will still happen. So if you remember the picture from the BTZ calculation, it's essentially exactly the same picture and exactly the same calculation, except now your geometry is much more complicated. So we have this uh, red vertical lines, which are the, which are the brains. Uh, and there is dynamical gravity living on the brain. And now I want to compute uh, the entanglement entropy of radiation region, which is, uh, let's say, starting from XR and going all the way to infinity. And now all I have to do in this W holographic scenario is to compute the corresponding RT surfaces. And as before, there are two of them. One is this, this blue one, which will start here and end on the brain itself. But the other one are the, uh, the orange ones, which will go all the way through the horizon. And these are the hard term on the circles, as we have saw, uh, as we saw before. Okay. And now we can proceed and do those computations. So before doing that, I'll just tell you very quickly two aspects of it. 
and I'll, 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 I'll stop there essentially. So if you remember, initially there was a, uh, there was a, there's a critical value of what I denoted by phi r uh, in the BTZ case. So if you remember that uh, below a certain phi r, you could not have the hartman malthus inner surface to be uh, a lower uh, entanglement entropy surface, right? So you had to have, so put in terms of uh, physically speaking, what that means is that you had to take the radiation region uh, sufficiently far from the brain such that you could reproduce the page curve. So if you took the radiation region too close to the brain, you could not reproduce the page curve. So it's an interesting question now that now that we have changed the geometry substantially, in fact, more specifically, we have changed the interior of the geometry substantially, more substantially than the exterior. Uh, what is happening with the page point? So this plot, for example, answers that. So this is a particular calculation in three dimension, or rather uh, uh, the bath is three plus one, uh, sorry, uh, the bath is three dimensional. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the, the brain is also three dimensional, but the, uh, but the bulk dual to the bath is actually three plus one dimensional, okay? So, so in, but, but I, uh, before, uh, before, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that is a particular choice uh, that you are taking, but this, this feature is generically qualitatively similar in every dimension. So what is the behavior? The behavior seems to be the following. So suppose I, I call or I define, uh, uh, define a page point, so to speak, as follows. That the page point is, uh, is basically this XP such that if I take XP, which is bigger than XR, I see a page curve. But if I take, uh, sorry, I should have done it the other, way. excuse me, this inequality is wrong. Uh, but if I, if I took XR bigger than XP, um, uh, there is no page curve. Meaning that uh, simply, simply said, what it says that, uh, suppose XP is the, is the, is the, uh, is the point or is the critical distance below which I cannot reproduce a page curve because the radiation region is too close to the brain and above which I can indeed reproduce the page curve because the radiation region is sufficiently far from the brain. So XP demarcates that. And if you plot how it depends on, uh, on, the, on the coupling of the relevant parameter, so this phi naught is the, is the strength of the relevant parameter, which is introducing the RG flow in the bath to begin with, uh, normalized with respect to the temperature raised to some appropriate power and so on. So for various deltas, for various conformal dimensions, you can make this plot and you find that this XP decreases monotonically, but it doesn't seem to be going all the way to zero. Although we can't access that, uh, I mean, we can't go to infinity strictly speaking, but it seems to sort of flatten, right? This curve seems to flatten. So what this seems to be suggesting is that uh, by increasing phi naught, in other words, by by increasing this uh, the relevant coupling, I can indeed bring this radiation region closer to the brain, and still reproduce the page curve. Now you might wonder what happens in a limiting case or in an extreme case, whether I can indeed bring the uh, radiation region arbitrarily close to the brain which is to say that I also make the radiation region a part of the gravity, a part of the gravity theory, because you see that the radiation region, if it is, if it was substantially far from the, from the brain, it was living in a region where gravity was not present. But now if, if I can still reproduce a page curve by bringing the uh, radiation region arbitrarily close to the, to the brain itself, then uh, and still reproduce the page curve. That would be a very interesting, uh, uh, interesting uh, statement to make. But of course, we cannot make that statement uh, not at this level. First of all, because numerically, it's not. I mean, uh, strict infinity is not accessible, and it, the, these curves are suggestive that there is nevertheless this gap always remains, or there seems to be a gap remaining. But it does decrease. So that's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, observation. I would say. So that's observation one. And then uh, the final observation that I'll end with is again a generic one. Uh, uh, and, and to do the calculation, uh, one has to fix certain values. For example, this is done for d equal to two. Uh, so small d equal to two. So basically the bath has, uh, 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 the bath is uh, d dimensional, uh, one plus one dimensional CFT. 
uh, deformed by some uh, relevant operator whose dimension is three by four. If you do that, then you can plot, uh, 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 I mean, if you take your uh, radiation region sufficiently far away and so on, such that you have the page curve, et cetera, you, you, you can plot this page time, the dependence of the page time with, uh, with, uh, with again, uh, uh, the, the coupling strength of the relevant deformation, which is phi naught, appropriately normalized with, uh, with temperature raised to some power, which makes it dimensionless. And then it seems to be suggesting the following that the page time does seem to be increasing as you dial your phi naught over t raised to two minus delta, but it doesn't seem to be going all the way to infinity. It's also it starts growing initially. It grows faster, but then it starts plateauing. Right? This is a numerical data, of course, but the, the trend of the curve is is uh, more or less clear. So what it says is that. I mean, it, it seems to be suggesting that even if I increase phi naught to be infinitely large or extremely large compared to compared to, compared to the temperature, I still have access to this fine grained uh, entropy because I still have the page time, although the page time will increase, but it doesn't seem to be seem to be blowing up. It seems to be going to a finite value. Okay. So that sort of an interesting statement, it seems to be saying that uh, the, the, the path dependence is, uh, is certainly there, but, but it's never there in the sense that uh, your qualitatively page curve completely disappears from, from your, uh, from your uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, regime of accessibility and so on and so forth. Of course, you could argue that this is uh, this is uh, expected because all we are doing are just uh, holographic calculations, and uh, even if I am doing uh, you know code training and so on and so forth, I'm still staying with a large CCFD, and I really do not know what might happen if I could actually, in principle, integrate out uh, uh, way more many you know degrees of freedom, uh, such that my path will no longer be a large CCFD. Uh, then, of course, none of this analysis can really tell you what might happen because that gets into a very uh, stringy regime, uh, which at least we, I do not know how to, how to make a statement about that. But, uh, but within the regime where we can make a statement, which is sharp and precise, it seems to be suggesting that the co even if you do post training uh, of your bath degrees of freedom, the, uh, the accessibility of page curve or page point, um, uh, rather page time, sorry, uh, is not gone. And in fact, the fine grain information is still present, uh, even within a coarse grained uh, grain path, uh, which, is, which is no longer a CFD. Or could say it in another way, you could take uh, an arbitrary arbitrary quantum field theory, which is, let's say, a deformation of a, of a CFD, and still obtain the page curve. So, so the path dependence is, uh, is in, that sense, uh, in that sense, somewhat mild. Uh, in that it doesn't change things qualitatively, but these behaviors might be interesting uh, in the in their own rights. So uh, I'll conclude here. As I said, that uh, by course training the path, uh, we can we seem to be able to choose the radiation region closer to the brain and uh, still obtain a page time. And as I was speculating, that it would be interesting to sort of push it to the real extreme limit and wonder what whether the radiation region can be brought all the way to the gravitating region. I mean, there are other studies that suggest that this should not be possible uh, because uh, there are other papers, for example, uh, uh, which says that uh, you know, if you take the, if you define your path in, uh, which is also gravitating. Then you don't seem to get a page curve. You in fact get a constant line. You don't get anything interesting. So, so it's likely. I mean, it's possible that uh, if we are able to push this to that limit, we will find something similar. But at this point, uh, it's not clear. But it's an interesting possibility to perhaps keep in mind. And then the final point. I mean, then the other point is, as I said, that the coarse grain path is still uh, access the page time. And uh, it seems to be increasing, but nevertheless, uh, it's there. And uh, uh, and uh, and one one other way to say the same thing is that that all we are doing is semi-classical gravity, and uh, but the semi-classical gravity seems to be still uh, aware of the of the UV physics, uh, just that you have to wait uh, for a longer time scale, meaning that uh, your page time increases. So the fact that your UV physics is unitary is manifest. If you were sufficiently long, so so that seems to be the that seems to be the other other level. 
So there are uh, uh, well, many, many loose ends uh, uh, and many, many future things that one can uh, one can perhaps do with this. Um, uh, so let me not let me not get into that, and uh, we end here. And uh, uh, thank you for for your attention. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Arnold, for uh, your nice contribution. Now you. Uh, before asking question, I would suggest all of you please unmute and give a clap for Arno for giving such a nice talk. And uh, uh, now you can ask questions, uh, but uh, yeah, like any question anybody can ask. If you have anything. No questions. Everybody have understood everything. <laughs> I think people are feeling tired. <laughs> yeah, that might be. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, anyways, thank you, Arno. This talk will be posted in uh, my channel. I will share the link with you and uh, stay safe and healthy and we will get in touch with you. And... Uh, like uh, maybe in near future, again, I can have you again with sure. some new idea when you have time and all. I'll be very happy. Yeah. Most importantly, stay safe and healthy with your family. Yes. Yeah. You too. You too. So bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.